Good evening, everyone. I know it's been a long day, so I'd actually thought I would start today with a, a funny story that's completely irrelevant to my talk. Um, this evening, I'm going to be talking about what happened to me. It's, it's no secret that I'm a photographer. I was injured in Afghanistan, during which time I lost both my legs and my arm. When I was injured in Afghanistan, I was picked up by a medivac helicopter. Um, these guys saved my life. I was still conscious after the explosion. So I'm in the back of this medivac helicopter. I spent 20 minutes on the journey back to Kandahar. And through those 20 minutes, I thought they would be the last of my life. So the bond you build with the medics on the back of that helicopter is hard to explain. They became almost like brothers to me. For those 20 minutes, they talked to me, they kept me calm, and I thought I was sharing the last minutes of my life with them. So about two years after I was injured, I decided I wanted to meet up with these guys and take them out for a drink. So I met up with them in Chicago. Now, I was kind of nervous. It was a bit like a blind date. We'd been sort of chatting on Facebook, and, but I'd never actually met these guys apart from the day that they saved my life. And it turns out they were equally nervous. So we met in this bar in Chicago. We have a couple of whiskeys, a couple of tequilas, a couple more whiskeys, a couple more tequilas. There's lots of hugs, kisses, crying. We have more whiskey, more tequila. And then we do the really sensible thing to do when you're that drunk. We went to a tattoo parlor. <laughs> now, we walk into this tattoo parlor. The guys wanted to get the date when they rescued me um, because it meant a lot to them. I hadn't realized how significant it was. Um, you'll see them at some point during this talk tonight. So we went in there to get the date when they rescued me tattooed. Um, I could hardly walk, but I was actually walking better than these two guys. We walk into the tattoo parlor, the tattooist is looking a little bit nervous, but these are big guys from the 101st Airborne, and they're like, we're getting tattoos today, buddy. So he agrees, and I go to sit down, and the chair has wheels. It's an office chair. Now, I should say chairs with wheels are like kryptonite to a legless person. They are our nemesis. If you try and sit on a, a chair with wheels with no legs, they scoot out and you fall. So combined with being very drunk, I'm kind of trying to sit on this chair, I fall on the floor, my leg comes off. I'm trying to push this chair around, trying to get on it. My other leg comes off. I'm still pushing this chair around. The two guys think it's the funniest thing they've ever seen, so they're just sitting there, standing there laughing at me. Now, this is a glass-fronted tattoo parlor in downtown Chicago. And a woman walks by, and she looks in, and she can just see a legless guy pushing a chair around with guys laughing. So she walks in, and she looks at, at these two guys, and she says, this man, evidently needs help. Without a breath, they just looked at her and they said, ma'am, we helped him once, we're not helping him again. <laughs> so today, really, I am going to talk about change. Uh, change really is the theme. Change in myself, and I think that's one of the key elements of this whole festival. Change first comes from within. The second is the change that happened to me physically. And the third is my belief that we can all change the world. I started as a photographer when I was 18. I had a car accident in the States. I ended up in, in hospital in London. And when I was in hospital at 18, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Up to that point, I did a lot of sport. And lying in this hospital bed, unfortunately, my godfather passed away. And when he died, he left me two things. One was a book by the war photographer Don McCullen, and the other was a little Olympus OM-10 camera. So lying in this hospital bed, I read this book of Don McCullen and his war photography, and I was completely taken by it. I was enthralled by his work in Vietnam, Angola, and various war zones. And when I would go to sleep at night, I would see these black and white images in my mind. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to tell stories. And so I taught myself, lying in this hospital bed, how to use this Olympus OM-10 camera. I used to photograph all the doctors and nurses and my friends where they'd come and visit. Obviously, I mainly photograph the nurses. <laughs> and I taught myself photography that way. And when I left, I resolved to go around the world and, and document things. But I got a little bit sidetracked. Um, I was, was 18, 19 at the time, I had a few friends in bands, and they started to ask me, would I photograph them? So before I knew it, I'd become a music and fashion photographer, and I was traveling around the world doing that. 
And I remember one Christmas, my um, Auntie Margaret, who's quite a stern woman, she said to me, Giles, I thought you wanted to go around the world and document war zones and do all this, and here you are photographing bands, doing fashion work. How come? And I looked at Auntie Margaret and I said, I've got to be honest. I said, I'm just doing it for the great parties and beautiful women. And she was like, no, seriously, Giles. And I said, I'm 19 years old. This is a legitimate reason for a career path. And for the next 10 years, that's what I did. I traveled around the world doing fashion and music photography. But in the back of my mind, there was always this element, this thing that made me think there was more that I could do with my work. And one day, I decided enough was enough. I'd become quite cynical about the fashion industry, the way that women were portrayed. And in the middle of a photo shoot, I actually walked away from photography. Now, the story is kind of rock and roll. The story is that in the middle of this photo shoot, I took my cameras, I said, that's it, I quit, and threw them out the hotel window. Well, anybody that knows me knows I'm not that rock and roll. I'm actually quite dull. Um, I threw them, I had a little hissy fit, I threw them onto the bed. They just happened to bounce out the window. But that was the end of my photography. I gave up uh, completely, and I moved uh, down to the coast, and I became a care worker. Now, people couldn't understand this. I'd given up this world of fashion to become a care worker. And I looked after a young guy called Nick who had very severe autism, and he used to self-harm. And people would say, well, you've given up this glamorous life to do this. Why? And I could say, for the first time, I was actually happy. I was caring for somebody on a day-to-day -day basis, and I could see the impact I was having on their life. And so for two years, I was Nick's full-time carer. Now, Nick, as I said, had very severe autism, and he used to self-harm, and he didn't really get the support that he needed. Then one day, sitting with his family, we thought, why don't I take photographs of his life to try and document his sense of isolation? And so that's what I started to do. I photographed Nick's day-to-day -day life. Now, as I say, one of the big problems was he would self-harm. And one day, Nick actually let me photograph himself harming. I won't show you that photograph today because it's too upsetting. But when we next showed these photographs to his healthcare professionals, I suddenly saw a change. I suddenly saw that they were reacting to his photographs. And I realized that was the eureka moment, that I could use my photography to give voice to people without a voice, that I could use my camera to be their advocate. So that's what I resolved to do, to travel the world, documenting people who don't have a voice, telling the stories of those that maybe don't appear in the day-to-day -day media. I started working with charities, and I would cover all sorts of issues, from acid burns attacks in Bangladesh to the famine in South Sudan. And I did this for many years. But sometimes I wondered if it was worthwhile. I wondered if I was making any kind of difference. Because I felt, I'm just a photographer. Why aren't I a doctor? Why aren't I a politician? Why don't I have the money to make a difference? One day in South Sudan, I took this photograph of a young boy who'd been shot. He'd been shot in the stomach and the arm and was dying. And the medic there, the, the doctor, couldn't save him. So I was left, and I had to make the decision, do I take a photograph? And I thought, I have to. I'm here to do my job. So I took a couple of frames, I put the camera down, and then I sat with the boy for the rest of the day. But that evening, I felt physically sick. I felt like a vulture. I thought, I shouldn't have taken this photograph. And I felt completely worthless being there, only able to take a photograph of a dying boy. And that evening, I spoke to the doctor, Dr. Murray, and I said to him, look, you know, I feel completely worthless. And he explained to me that as a boy living in the outback in Australia, he had read magazines like National Geographic and Sunday papers. And seeing photographs like this, had inspired him to become a doctor. And seeing photographs like this had inspired him to go and work in places such as Africa. And that's when I really realized we can't change the world on our own, but we can all be cogs in a bigger wheel of change. And everybody sat here today has the power to create change. I don't believe one individual can do it, but working together, we can all find a role. And for me, photography was that role. I want to tell you briefly about a story I did in uh, Ukraine, which really sums up why I do the work I do. Um, this was a, a story I did on street kids living in Odessa. A lot of people, a lot of kids, 
come from various parts of the Soviet Union to try and find money there, try and find jobs. And when they get there, they find there are none, so they end up living on the streets. And a lot of them become drug users, a lot of them involved in crime. And people said to me, you're only going to photograph these people. These people are worthless. But I wanted to tell their story. So I became friends with this group, um, this gang run by Sasha, the guy at the front. And I got to know them, and I started living with them and documenting their life. And sometimes the house was full of violence. They copied behaviors that they'd learned from their parents. But there was also a lot of tenderness. This is when one of them had cut themselves, and the others were tending to the wounds. So I spent my time there, and on the final day, they took me down to the Black Sea to, to go and have a celebration before I left. And I got there, and they were drinking vodka and, and having pickled goods. And Sasha, the leader of the gang, comes up to me. He puts his arm around my neck, and he goes, you, me, we're going swimming in the Black Sea. And I looked at him, and I was like, I don't think that's a good idea. And he's like, no, we have to go. Now, I should say, when I go traveling, I always Google and, and read Lonely Planet guides. And three things I was told about Odessa, avoid the street kids, watch out because there's a lot of petty crime, and whatever you do, don't go swimming in the Black Sea. So obviously, I paid a lot of attention to that. Now, I'm in swimming in the Black Sea, and in the background, you can see some of the kids, and they actually had all my cameras, my passport, my wallet. And I'm thinking, oh, great, this is when they run away. I have to go to the police station in my wet underwear, and the police would say, well, what happened? And I'd say, well, I gave all my stuff to some street kids because I wanted to go swimming in the Black Sea. <laughs> but of course, they didn't, because we had built up trust. And that's one of the most important things in the work that I do. And in fact, what was happening in the background was one of the young kids, Lilik, was stamping on the ground. And when the seagulls took off, he was taking a photograph. And I was watching him do that, and I thought, wow, that's incredible. He's really thinking about the image he wants to create. And so I spoke to Lilik, and I said, when I get back to the UK, I'm going to get you a camera, I'm going to send it out here, and you can start to take photographs. And that evening, uh, before I said goodbye to everybody, I took this picture of Lilik and his girlfriend, Rusella. And I said, I'm going back to the hostel where I'm staying, but in the morning, I'll come by and I'll say goodbye. In the morning, I came to say goodbye to the gang, and Lilik was dead. That night, he may be taking too much vodka, maybe the pills that they nicked from the pharmacy, or maybe just the cold and damp, maybe his whole life. But his girlfriend, Rosella, found him cold in bed. He was probably 12, 13 years old. And the police came, they took his body, and they dumped it in an unmarked grave. Because to most people, his life was worthless. But to me, it meant something. To me, his life is as important as anybody in this room, as my friends, as my family. And that's why I tell these stories. Now, as well doing this work, I found myself in Afghanistan. I was embedded with a group of American soldiers when this happened. We heard it over the radio that it was going to be a triple amputee. A triple amputee is not necessarily uncommon, but it definitely ups the oh no factor. Not many of those make it. The casualty Phil and CJ were picking up was Giles. He'd been photographing an American unit on a dawn patrol when he stood on a Taliban IED. I have a memory of just floating. With no sound, nothing, but this, this intense heat. And then a sudden impact and just landing on my side. You can see my legs had gone. I just thought that was it. I've seen people with far less injuries succumbing to their injuries very quickly. And I remember just thinking in my mind at that point, I'm not fucking dying in Afghanistan. The biggest thing was loss of blood. 
We needed to make sure that his body wasn't going to go too far into shock. We had to uh, go with an interosseal device, which is, um, in layman's terms, it's a ballpoint pen that goes into your sternum so you can push fluids through into the bone marrow. He just kind of like gritted down and took the first one uh, like a champ, really. But as soon as they started to flush, that's when the major pain, that's when he really like, he opened up his eyes, he heard him yell. keep alive for 10 minutes, and keep alive for five minutes. That's really all I'm thinking about. Giles was being taken to the hospital at the US military base in Kandahar. What's your name? Giles. OK. everything that my body had to keep focused till Kandahar. I think at that point my brain just, just switched off. I then spent 46 days in intensive care. My family was called in twice to say their goodbyes. Uh, everybody was told I wasn't going to live. My lungs gave up, my kidneys gave up. Um, as I say, on two occasions I had to witness my family saying goodbye to me. I was unable to communicate. My hand was in a cast. I had tubes down my throat. Somehow, miraculously, I survived. And after two months, I was returned to a normal ward. And really, that's where the battle started for me, because I then had to come to terms with my new reality, my change. I had no legs. I had one arm. I was told I would never walk again. I was told I'd definitely never work. I would never live independently. As far as I was concerned, my life was over. I remember they took me for a shower in a wheelchair for the first time after three months, and I saw myself for the first time, and I cried. And that evening, I decided I would rather die than carry on. But there was one thing that kept me going, one thing, and that was that I still had my voice, that I was still a photographer. And I resolved, if I could find a way to still take photographs, none of this would matter. And so six months after my injury, and so six months after my injury, I decided to take a portrait. I decided to confront my fear of how I now looked. I thought of Roman and Greek statues, and I thought how when you see them in a museum, even if they're broken, they are still beautiful. And so I decided to create what I call my Greek statue photograph. And really, that was the moment when I said, this is what's happened to me, but I don't care. And it was the moment when I said, I am still a photographer. What followed was 37 operations, another year of rehabilitation. But eventually, I learned to stand. I learned to take photographs. And 18 months after I was injured, I was back in Afghanistan taking photographs, doing the work that I am proud to do, photographing individuals injured in the same way as I am. And I still continue to do the work that you see here. In this year alone, I have traveled to 14 countries documenting conflicts and their effects on civilians. And people say to me, why would you go back to these places? Why would you carry on this work? And I'll be honest, I feel honored and privileged to do it because I found my cog on that big wheel of change. I found that being a photographer gave voice to people without voice. And if people say to me, give me one example, I will show them this picture. This picture's of Atola, a seven-year-old boy who was walking to school. And he stepped on a landmine. He was injured just a few 
miles away from when I was injured. He was injured just a couple of months after I was injured. And people say to me, do you cry taking photographs? And I will say, no, but this day I did. Because I looked at Tola, and I thought to myself, why should a seven-year-old boy have to go through the pain that I go through every day, both physically and mentally, simply because he was walking to school? And so I feel it's my duty to tell his story. And people say to me, well, you must be incredibly angry. You must have a lot of hatred for the Taliban, for the people that did this to you. And I can say, honestly, I have no hatred. I have no space for that in my heart. I don't think I was injured by the Taliban. I don't think I was injured by a landmine. I was injured by hatred and by ignorance. And the only way I know how to fight that is with my camera and with my voice. And the great irony is rather than silence me, that bomb made my voice that much louder. Thank you for listening. I get emotional now.